I don't know. I don't think I'd be living here. I wouldn't be sitting here in these clothes. It probably went a whole different other way. I probably wouldn't even be in New York. I probably never, yeah, I probably never went to New York. Yeah, I think that's why he fucked with Derek, too, is to yeah. see what he would do. <laughs> well, we knew that that was probably going yeah. on. We're like, come on, probably just giving him some shit, you know, just to get, get him all Because, man, he up. would buzz my fucking balls, man. It was like a fucking job with Derek. And don't start yeah. when I started working with Derek. Oh, my God, man. That was like a 24-hour <laughs> fucking death camp. Go to uh, let's go to work. Kamu supposed to be if I was late to work, this dude would fucking bust my balls. So you, did then did you bring Pete with you? Right. Okay. Because I mean Pete knew intellect, mm. but intellect was more interest. It was interesting to me because because at that time there was a fallout with all of us. Like, oh, he wants to just only fuck with you. He don't want to fuck with nobody else. Wouldn't well, fuck you. And then I was just like, all right, well then fuck me. And then Pete was like, fuck it, I'm rolling with you. And I'm like, well, I'm rolling with you, so because we were just like boys like that. Because they were always just shit on me, like shit on me behind my back. But at the same time, like you never have this dope, man. So I just started running with intellect. Like this dude's going to teach me something. And then Derek just was on it. And Pete, Pete seen progress. And he was like, Pete is dope. That's a dope white boy. He can run. Mm -hmm. and, and he's like, you know, fuck with y'all. Let's do some songs that way. And that's when me and Pete, me and Pete came up with Mega. Yeah. And we're like, all right, me and you and Megahertz. You know, I, I think about Megahertz and those guys, you know, they I, I don't know if they knew what they had. Maybe they did know what they have. Man, if they would have stuck together, the talent, think of the talent pool of Intellect, RJD2, Camus, and Copyright. Just those four. The world was in their hands, so it was mm -hmm. up to them to make it happen. They had it. They were at the the right age, the right age, the right time, the right period. And I remember, I remember that that first twelve inch. I remember. Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I mean, when those kids first came in the Groove Shack, um, you know, they they just already looked like stars right, right you know even if they were neighborhood stars they yeah. already looked the part and I, they were conscious of that they knew right. what they were doing and right. everything initially i had met them at the groove shack i've known no knew of them through the groove shack just from open mics and stuff and um i was doing uh, my radio show with adrian at ohio state and we had them come in one night and um you know they they kind of ripped it on the radio for about a half hour straight and we were, i was just blown away and back then i mean i used to go to the groove shack and rap and stuff and that was probably the last day i rapped the day that i heard them come in because i was like i can't do what these kids do man i stop i quit but it just intrigued me a lot because i just thought they were so talented and i thought what are you doing what are you doing with this you know uh -huh. we mess around at home we mess around our four track and do whatever make songs in our base in our bedroom you know and i thought you guys have a lot of talent. You should really try to put something together, you know. And, and I knew a guy who could get us some CDs mass produced. I and mean, back then, I mean, you know, I don't even think we could burn CDs at home back then. Yeah. But I think uh, I knew a guy that could get us stuff. So we went out and we got some studio time with Derek and some other places and around town and just, you know, put a little demo together. Uh, after having all the CDs made, it turns out they don't, he didn't accept CDs <laughs> to take a tape. So we had to put it all on tape and we literally drove to New York City and uh, stopped at his shop and dropped the, disc, dropped the tape off and came home. Like the first time we went to see Bob, Bob was DJing at a Madonna party and invited us to a Madonna party. So like the very first time I've ever been in New York, I went to the Madonna party. <laughs> driving, in a, like? driving eight hours in a fucking in a Dodge Neon, like mm -hmm. me, Pete, Adrian, Nelson. Phil, me, Pete, Adrian, Phil, and and Nelson in the fucking car, mm -hmm. driving. You and Pete are about six feet eight. Yeah, though. In the car, just like what the fuck. Driving eight hours, and soon we get there, we go to the hotel. We don't even have time to clean up. We just go to the hotel, drop our shit, and go straight to Madonna party. I'm fucking, my mind's fucking blown. Yeah. I'm just like, oh man, I gotta get in this shit, man. Yeah. Look like at all these fucking idiots. I'm just like <laughs> laughing. I'm like, I want this shit is stupid, man. I want to be a part of this shit. Probably about a month later, we heard from him, and he said, hey, I, you know. I, Dig your stuff. I want to put a 12 inch out, and um, we put world premiere and Kamu out on that first 12 inch. And um, went out to New York, did a couple shows. We did a show at the New York weekend, did a show in Philadelphia, Footwork in Philly. 
um, did the Stretch and, Bob, and Bobito show, and um, you know everything kind of took off from there. You know, mm -hmm. and it's just even now, all the connections they made back then were all from that first deal. You know, from meeting with Bob and, and he hooked up with LP and those guys, and you know all that kind of well, that was a nucleus for all of that. They really were so immature. I mean, these these two guys were the best, well dressed, uh, unemployed people you ever knew. True. <laughs> you know, they always had the gear. They never had a job. I mean, they had the gear. Never had a dime in their yeah, pocket. Never had money. You know. Uh, as a matter of fact, we get to New York, and I had told them when we go, you guys got to have money. And we get there, and we go to buy some pizza, and one of them didn't have any money. And I'm like, are you kidding me, dude? You just came to New York City with nothing. You know, they had the skills. And somebody, you know, somebody saw it and was able to, to capitalize on that. You know, we're, uh, we're happy and supportive of, of all of that. But, you know, again, it just says that this was a nest. And, you know, when it was time for them to, to move on, we, we couldn't do any more mm -hmm. here yeah. in Columbus that, you know, you move on to the, to the next uh, arena. And, uh, you know, it's nice just to be able to say, hey, we got a couple of people who put us on the map. Well, I was living in New York at the time, and I heard uh, one of my singles at the moment, it was uh, Tower of Babel, got played on Hot 97, like back to back by Pete Rock, like Pete Rock was DJing. And that right there was one of those moments, like I was like, all right. What were you thinking, man? I was just thinking like, why would they play me? Like, <laughs> like it's crazy, man. Like, it's cra You gotta think, as many records as there are there now, you know, at the moment or whatever, right. and they play yours, you're just like, wow, they're right. playing my shit. Like, they don't have to do this. Yeah. And for them to play it like back to back, it's like, you don't believe it. How, how long did Megahertz stay together um, after that first 12 inch? And kind of what, what happened? What Megahertz started the at the 12 inch, and Megahertz ended when Copy put out his high exalted riff. It's a shame. It's a fucking shame. You know, people go their separate ways, and it's hard to keep a group of 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds together. I mean, how are you gonna do that? My God, what if? You know, you think about those things, what if? What if megahertz stayed together? They could have been the holders of the Columbus scene, as far as putting it out there worldwide, they could they could be out there. Yeah. You met them, they were just coming around to the yeah. jackets. Yeah. They, they, they was in high school still. Mm -hmm. So they used to come over every day, you know, so. I just think, you know, put all the ego mess aside and remember this and do your thing. You're, you're battling some medical issues right now in your life. I started partying this shit a lot and uh, and just fucking started just like doing massive amounts of coke and just smoking weed and shit. But work still working, just a maniac, just on some barbarian yeah. shit. <laughs> and like, just like, whatever, like just not really realizing like I'm getting older and shit and like just kind of disrespecting my body. But I kept having these like back, back problems and shit. It was a day before we had a drive day and it was like uh, Thanksgiving. We had Thanksgiving at fucking Denny's or some stupid <laughs> shit. And, that, and I ordered, we all ordered the steak and shit, and like, I didn't even touch the food, I was just like, ugh, I just want to sleep. So I got in the car, I popped the Zanny bar, and we get to the hotel, and I was like, just, just like, a side shit was hurting so bad. Like, a week later after the tour, remind you, I've been on tour for like, six months almost and shit, half the year. Like, last, last year, I was on tour for like, half the year almost. Because I went out on like, I did like three tours. So I get home. I'm doggy pat. I'm literally doggy walking up the stairs, and I can't like I can't move, and it was like hurting to move, and like like I couldn't walk. I was like real fatigued, and I would take like baths. I would just like sit in the bath, hot bath, hot water. That's the only thing that made me feel good, and it would like wouldn't last like that long. Yeah. Like it would the pain would just come back, and I was just like ugh, and I just had this pain, and my one day I was just like fucked up. My girl was like, you gotta go to the doctor. And I'm like, man, I don't even have no money. I don't have no insurance. What the fuck? Went to the hospital, and they were like, we don't know what you have. And I was just scared, man. Like, I thought I had AIDS. I was like, man, I hope I don't got fucking AIDS. That'd be the worst shit ever. And, like, they thought I had TB, and they were like, they did ran a TB test for tuberculosis. They ran a fucking AIDS test. Two days later, my AIDS test comes back 
fucking straight. And then like a couple of days later, my TB test comes back straight. But then they had news for me. And they were like, you got lung cancer. And I'm just like, oh, man. And I'm like, how the fuck did I get lung cancer? And like, it's just, it's genetically what's just going to happen. So like, me and my girl crying. And I'm like going through changes, man. And I was out, I was like in a coma for like at least two months. Three, two and a half months or some shit. Just out of it. I don't really remember anything. Then my doctors are just like, it don't look really good. And I was just like, damn, this is so fucked up. I had blood on my lung, blood around my lung, blood around my heart, and my and my liver was like, wasn't functioning. Everything was like shutting down and shit. I was literally walking dead, man. I had all this shit going on in me, and like I didn't know. I gotta think about. I'm thinking about all that shit. I'm in the middle of this doing this album, I'm thinking about this shit. I'm thinking about, I might die. I might, you know what I'm saying? Like, it might just be over. And, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, I'm fighting. I'm like, whatever y'all gotta fucking do, do it. How the fuck did I work to this point to die? It's like, no. Right. Fuck that, man. Right. What's keeping you going? Life is keeping me going. Yeah. Yeah. I'll answer it like that. Life is keeping me going. As long as life is going, I guess I can go until life doesn't go anymore for me. I don't know. It's just, apparently, it's, you know, my destiny is written. We thought we were going to be fabulously successful with our record store. We should have been able to do it, you would think, but <clears throat> were we, we, we were just too arrogant, man, to think that we knew it all. I kind of think, I, I was kind of that way. I was kind of like, you can't tell me what to do, I know what I'm doing, I'm freaking, you know, yeah. on this show. I don't know, was it? I don't know, maybe our overconfidence in knowing about the music or our love for the music may have drifted over and made us feel inflated in areas we shouldn't have yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, but we know what we're doing yeah kind we, of thing. we know all about because we're doing knowledge. different stuff that nobody was doing we had the dj contest we you know paid the winner a hundred dollars 150 or whatever it was we had the you know the very first hip-hop expo down at the convention center we kept spending money you know and we weren't really looking at the numbers yeah i mean we weren't it was like we wanted to, we just kept wanting to do these things with the cable access the my open mics you know that all costs money and we'd have an open mic here there'd be a hundred and some people here we would sell one record that night because that's what they came for was the open mic mm -hmm. and a lot of the kids you know they, they you know this was the place this was the place but not everybody had a lot of money to spend we had our fan base, our fan club, all those kids, and it was great and all that stuff, but we couldn't get people to come in, not necessarily them, I would say they bought records and all that kind of thing, but we couldn't bring in other people to, to buy records because we were battling the chains. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's when all that CD Wars crap was going on. That CD shit killed us mm -hmm. because we would have to buy CDs and we hated it. We didn't want to do it. They were so expensive. And if you couldn't sell them, you're stuck with them. And media play and all that would get. They would put the CDs out four days before the release date. And not get in trouble. And not get in trouble. Right. They put them out at a cost less than what we were paying our distributors <coughs> for them. We would call up record labels. We would call up distributors saying, Media Play's doing this, do something about it. They didn't give a rat's ass. Because we were, we were, we were this. We were, this. We were little groove shack. Right. And so we get, we get killed. So when the brand new huge record was coming out that we thought we could sell a bunch of copies, you know, we couldn't because it, the, 
all the kids already bought them. I mean, why would we want them to think that they were going to spend it, spend two dollars, three dollars more at our store when they could get it cheaper? Remember uh, when we sold, uh, we got the Gangstar uh, hard. The one with the orange cover. Orange mm -hmm. Yeah, we knew it was going to be huge, man. This, mm -hmm. this is like right up our alley. This is like the, it, you know, I mean, that is it. That epitomizes our store, in Premier and Guru. And they, right. you know, they're gods to us. And mm -hmm. this is one of the early big, you know, things. New releases were on Tuesday. Well, I go over there on a Friday morning, you know, to pick up some stuff. And they're like, hey, your gang star is here. You know, it's not, you know, not due out till Tuesday. You want to pick it up now? Save you a trip. I'm like, Sure, that'd be, that'd be great, dude. You know, I understand the new release date thing and all that stuff, and I'm really, really hungry for money. So I start telling a few people about it, you know, like, oh, you know, it's good customers. They're like, oh, dude, let me just see it, man. Let me just see it. So I take him in the back room and I show him the record, you know, I'm like, dude, you know, here it is, man. Uh, you know, and they're like, oh, man, can I buy it now? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, I'm like, but don't tell anyone, yeah. you know, so like a couple hours later, someone else comes in talking to him. This is all day on Friday. And then pretty soon Saturday and Sunday, we're selling the shit out of it. You know, mm -hmm. and we go through half of our supply easily just by word of mouth. Well, Monday morning comes and get a call from campus records and they are furious because world records sent a spy down to see if they would we would sell them you mm -hmm. know a the gangstar album and we and i did of yeah. course i didn't know who it was by then i'm like but the cat's out of the bag no one will know well you know the red, other stores that were very jealous of us even though we were nothing to them mm -hmm. financially you know that they were just livid and i c really couldn't do anything about it because i was like yeah we did yeah, we sold it, man. I mean, he's like, because World Records sent someone down there to check it out, and then you sold, you know, so I couldn't lie. I'm like, yeah, you know, I was just like selling to a couple friends, and, you know, he's like, well, you heard, we heard you had it out, you know, and I'm like, yeah, we did, you know. And so they were going to cut us off, you know, and, and we were going to get blacklisted in the industry. Mm -hmm. And that was like, yeah, you know, I, remember that. I mean, that was a really, really big deal. You know, and that was just part of, you know, I mean, that was us being dumbasses, me, yeah. primarily, you know, being just a dumbass. I'm sure I was behind you going, go ahead and do yeah, it. You're like, <laughs> I know I was, because I said, you know, yeah. and, but it, it's like, the, you know, those are the, those are the days, man. You just think like, wow, man, you know, it's like, you can't win. You just can't yeah. win. You know, That's when we kind of started feeling a little bit powerless. We were dying, you know, we were dying. I was married. I had three kids and, um. You know, I was working full time and I come in here, you know, just, you know, working ourselves the bone. Marty in here, just giving it his all. And um, people didn't understand that they needed to buy the stuff that was in here to keep us going. You know, there was always that part of me was like, man, it's really not my store. It's Marty's store because I, I didn't put any of my money up. And it, I always had that feeling like, oh, what? I'm, who am I? What am I doing here? So I really didn't want to have any say so in what went on. I know, you know, Marty would let me pick records out to order and stuff. And, um, I would always rule, go with my heart instead of my head when I was ordering, um, which it wasn't the way to do it. I would always feel guilty that I wasn't at the store more than what I was, um, and I felt bad about it. Um, I felt bad for Marty because I know he wanted me there more often. Okay, I've, I've bitten this thing off and it may be more than I can chew. After about three years in business, Groove Shack started to falter. Mike wanted to leave. We weren't making any money. After all of our success, things started to go south. The grind started wearing on us. Um, the, the, the business problems we talked about earlier and it kind of just wore us down uh, wore us down emotionally mentally and physically Marty more so it was like we had this trajectory that shot up and then just slowly had this downwards arc before that uh, uh, I don't know how long it was before that Marty bought me out I think we just knew that it wasn't it, we knew it was dying and we knew it was gonna die and we didn't really talk about it a whole lot. We did, but we didn't. 
a lot of things we didn't talk about because I think it was just too painful for both of us. I love the Groove Shack, man. I was sad when you closed your doors. Yeah, yes, man, that was sad when you that was a man. dark day. Hey, that man. was a dark day in hip hop in Columbus. They were shocked. They were stunned. They couldn't believe it. Um, they were mad at us. They were mad. There's still some of them are still mad. I felt the dark shadow come over my brain and my body and my soul. I said, oh, snap, no more hip hop. It's no more hip hop. And you know what, Marty? When that shut down, that's just when the essence of hip hop went underground and now rap is taking over. I don't want no rap, I want hip hop. And when y'all left, hip hop left. Yeah. Yes, sir, bro. Yeah. Period. Yeah, that outlet to rhyme and the battle was. Yeah, yeah. There ain't been nothing else since that. Since the Groove Shack and they, it's been, they got open mics here and there, but, but there's nothing like, raw nothing like, like the Groove that. Shack. Nothing like Nothing's the Groove raw like the Groove Shack. Shack. That was the end of the world. <laughs> that was the end of our world, man. Like shit was. Uh, we didn't know where we were gonna go. I was, I was closing out. It was the last day I was here, and <clears throat> I was getting robbed. Actually, I was in the process of this strange robbery, and. Um, I left the door unlocked and I had the, the, everything was all closed up in the front. And these two guys roll in, never seen them before, and I could tell immediately that they were thugs. And, and I was the only one in here, and I was taking stuff out, and it was you know the last day. And, um, and then I thought, um, you know, how am I going to get out of this? You know, so I was like, they were kind of messing with me, ch make, ch checking around to see if there was anyone else in here, and you know, no one else was coming in, and I was expecting this one guy to show up. And he didn't. So uh, what happened was they, um, you know, kept you know saying, "Hey, can can I have this? You know, can I have that? You know?" And it's like um, I, I wasn't sure what to do. I carried a gun, and I had it here, and it was loaded, and it was right next to me. And it was one of those points in time in your life where you think, "Do I pull the gun? And do they have one? And am I willing to shoot someone?" Because if you pull the gun, you got it. You can't like not shoot it. So, uh, you know, I, I, it, I was, it was really dicey. And what I did is I outsmarted them. I, I was pretending like I was getting a phone call because we had two lines. So I, I secretly called the other line, and the phone rang, and I picked it up. Um, but what I was doing was I was calling the cops, and I was calling 911. And so I was saying, hey, you know, this is, you know, Marty at the group, at, uh, you know, the group shack and, you know, hey, yeah, you know, just uh, wanted to see what you guys are up to. And, you know, the first operator hung up on me. And so I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to die. And, you know, these guys, I could just tell that they were going to rob me at least. I called 911 again and I was pretending like, you know, and then they, they caught on. And they're like, oh, okay. They're like, is, is someone in there? And I'm like, yes, you got it. <laughs> and they're like, um, are, you know, is, do, you, do you want someone's car to come right now? I'm like, yes, as, you know, so I was pretending. I was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> and these guys had no idea. And like two or three minutes later, the cops showed up. You know, that was like the ultimate ending to this to the store. Um, you know, it was like, and that was the last day, and that was the last day I was in here. Yeah, it was crazy. You know, I had just gone through the worst month of my life, basically closing this store and selling everything off and telling everybody that, you know, it's over, mm -hmm. the party's over, and you know that I'm, you know, I'm in debt and I can't go on, and that's why. You know, and then this, you know, that day, and I'm like, I'm, I'm like, no, I don't want, to, I just no, want to get out of here. Yeah. yeah. Marty and I, we, we, I mean, we were very, we were very, very, very close for a long time, I and mean, we talked to each other every day on the phone. Even um, we did everything together, you know, did, shared everything together and all our interests and stuff. And it, 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 it took a toll on our friendship. It was just not good. None of it was good uh, at the end. Marty was worn out. He was like. It, it just hurt to see him in every there every day and just nothing happening and it just killed me. I was so wiped out. I wanted nothing to do with music, with the Groove Shack, with hip hop, with customers, with Mike Curry, with anything. I didn't want to see anything for I don't know how many reasons. One, a big one was financial. You know what? 
Mike Curry's dad was right. Don't go into business with your best friend because bad things can happen. It ki it killed our friendship. That didn't kill it. It it fucked it up real bad. Our friendship. Um, we kind of drifted apart. We didn't talk to each other after the store closed. So those first couple years after the group shack.